Well, good evening, church family. Uh, welcome back to our Wednesday night prayer and devotional time. Uh, today we're in Psalm 30, and this is a special psalm. It's a psalm that David wrote for the dedication of the temple. This was an event that would happen after his death, and so he's sending a message forward to an event that he would not be there to participate in. He has a very strong message for us, and um, a message of hope, a message of encouragement, and um, just a little bit of a snapshot of really the roller coaster ride that, that was David's life and his experience through that. So, uh, again, hope you have your Bibles with you and you've made your way to Psalm 30. Let's go ahead and read together and see what the psalmist has to say for us. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, asking him to lead us at this time. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks, as we always do, uh, for your word. We thank you for uh, this insight that we have into the life of David. Lord, we pray uh, that as we hear uh, these these words that he has for us, uh, Lord, this plea that he has for us uh, to, be, uh, to be grateful, to rejoice, Lord, that we would take this plea to heart, and uh, Father, that we would rejoice with everything in our lives because we are truly grateful for the blessings that we receive from you. Lord, we just uh, pray that you also give us the patience to remember uh, the words it says in here, that joy comes in the morning. Lord, we just ask that you uh, help us to understand that better here as we uh, go through this text. May you be glorified at this time, and we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So again, as I mentioned, um, this was a, a song for an event that David would not be a part of, and so he's sending forward this message of, uh, uh, again, of hope, um, kind of saying, look, this is what the Lord has done for me. But he's also sending uh, some words of encouragement and a little bit of uh, a plea to the people. And so there are three major sections that I, I really kind of see in here. Um, you know, beginning, we, we kind of have bookends of praise. So we can kind of say four major sections. He's praising the Lord at the beginning and at the end. Um, I extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. Of course, we see that very true in the life of David. He's recognizing the way that God has brought him to this point. Um, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. You brought me up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. David is not oblivious to how blessed he truly has been in his life, how much he has received from the Lord. And he begins with that. That's important. We, you know, we talk a lot of times about how we should pray to the Lord. And the first thing that we should do is really just recognize what God has already done for us. You know, too many times we sort of jump straight to the "this is what I need" uh, part of prayer, and we completely forgot what, or forget what God has already done for us. And so David here demonstrates this, but he moves into these three sections that I see after. And um, the the next is this plea, beginning with verse four: "Sing praises to the Lord, O you His saints, and give thanks to His holy name, for His anger is but for a moment, and His favor is for a lifetime." Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. 
So David is speaking from this personal experience of having to walk through tragedy, a lot of it of his own doing. Uh, this is why, you know, he's making this mention, uh, his anger is but for a moment. David certainly felt the anger of God from time to time in his life. And to be fair, so do we. You know, we don't like to think about the fact that our lives may anger God, that sometimes the bad things that we experience uh, are just punishment for our actions, for our, our wayward nature. But it only lasts for a moment. See, God corrects us, and then he restores us. And that's so beautiful. His, his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. His favor is for a lifetime. Think about that. When we find ourselves discouraged, it's for a moment. It goes away. But the favor of the Lord, the blessing of our salvation, never goes away. It is for a lifetime. But we need that correction from the Lord. You know, I, I saw a, uh, a quote, and uh, honestly, I wish I could recall uh, who had said it, and I apologize, I owe you that. Perhaps I'll get that back to you uh, sometime very soon here. But it said that the God, of course, shows his anger and his correction, but even more so when he is silent. You see, when God corrects us, it shows that he, he does love us, that he chooses to restore us, to get us back on the right path. But when he does not, correct us. It would mean a foregone conclusion. It would mean that there is no hope. There is no redemption. So we should rejoice when we receive the correction of the Lord. Obviously, we shouldn't rejoice because we needed it in the first place. Uh, we don't rejoice over our sin, but we rejoice because the Lord loves us enough to correct us. His correction demonstrates his love, and it's only uh, the, the correction portion is only for a moment. His love, of course, is forever. And then, of course, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. This is a message that I think we all need to remember from time to time. You know, we have a lot of struggles in this world. We have a lot of problems that, that come. And, you know, I don't, I don't mean to diminish any of the struggles that we have, because some of you are going through some very major trying times in your life and your burdens may be great but joy comes in the morning there will come a day in which the problems of this world fade away and that day may be uh, you know very soon that's not to, to mean you know the, the passing into glory as the the end of our problems but you know the lord does remove these burdens from us in due time we bear them for a time and life goes on we, we move into uh, this period of, of rejoicing. You know, our sorrow turns to gladness, and we are thankful for what the Lord has done, and we use this as an opportunity to give Him glory, to give Him praise. David speaks to that uh, a little later when he is talking about, you know, what profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? You know, we are allowed to walk through these valleys and walk through these shadows uh, we are allowed to endure a little bit of suffering and pain because that is truly what we deserve sometimes We, you know, because of our sin. But we are allowed to endure that so that we can experience the blessing of the redemption, the, the blessing of the rescue from the struggles of this world. And we can give God praise. What profit is there in our death if we go down to the pit? Will the dust praise the Lord? We are redeemed and restored so that we can give him glory. So we see here that David is encouraging them to sing praises to the Lord. Again, this is a, a moment that he wouldn't experience with them. Uh, give praises to the Lord. Give thanks to his holy name. Uh, again, being thankful for his love, his correction. Uh, being thankful for his presence in their life and for what he has brought them to. Now, it's important to remember that that the reason, the specific reason here uh, for the, the thanksgiving was the dedication of the temple. And it's important to remember what the temple represents. It represents this perfect union with God. And when we think back to the moments that we've had that with the Lord, uh, the first, of course, was in the Garden of Eden, 
where we had this perfect uh, communion with God, and we fell short of that. You know, sin entered the picture, and we were unable to ma maintain that perfect status uh, with, with God, and we had to be exiled from the garden. And so that place of unity uh, was taken uh, from us. We were cast out from that because we couldn't stand up to the standard that was set before us. And then we move into the, the time of the tabernacle in which the, the dwelling place of the Lord was carried with man. And as we move from place to place, it was uh, sort of our, our burden, if you will, to sort of carry this dwelling place uh, with us so that we could be with the Lord. But even that had its problems. You know, it had to be moved from place to place. It had to be safeguarded. And, and it was just, uh, it, it was so difficult to to keep that going. It was it was just always sort of flawed in a, in a sense. And then we moved to the temple. This, what was intended to be this permanent dwelling place for the Lord. This grand temple that would never fall. And of course we know how that ends. The temple certainly does fall. There's, there's nothing permanent about this. What we had desired to build up and create something everlasting didn't last very long at all. And one thing that David would never see fully is the fourth. The fourth perfect union that we have with Christ. We were with him uh, in, the, in the garden. We were with him in the tabernacle. We were with him in the temple. But none of those would last forever. None of those would stand. Because we couldn't keep up with them. We couldn't uh, meet the, the measure of sin. We couldn't keep up with the movement of the tabernacle. We couldn't, uh, you know, keep the, the temple standing. And where we failed at every single time, God overcame. Because the fourth and final perfect union that we have is that of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. Christ came to this earth to be with us. Where we failed to be with him, he closed the gap and came to be with us. And as the Holy Spirit dwells within us, that is a union that cannot be broken down. We have reason to celebrate. We have reason to give praise, and even more so than David ever knew. Because, of course, David wasn't alive for that. He was celebrating this temple. But we have the union that will never fade, that will never fall. And so we should give thanks. We should sing praises to the Lord for what he has done. David, of course, was celebrating a dedication of a temple built by human hands, and we celebrate the dedication of a temple that was built by God's very own hands. After this, there's a prayer. So we have a plea uh, to the people. We have a prayer, and it says, As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face I was dismayed. Now, there's a little bit of a huge roller coaster in, in just that section right there. He's, he's starting off talking about the prosperity that he experienced because of the Lord. And of course, David did experience great prosperity because of the Lord. And he's saying, in uh, the height of his prosperity, he says, I shall never be moved. And we find that to be true in our lives as well. Sometimes we experience prosperity in this world and we begin to think a little too highly of ourselves. And we think that we, we are a little bit untouchable because of how good life is going. I will never be moved. But he goes on in verse 7 to say, By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. By your favor. Now, we have to keep this in context with what he's about to say. Right? This is saying, in spite of what I did, in spite of who I was, you continued to allow me to stand strong. You continued to to allow me to stand firm against my enemies. That's in spite of who David was and what he was doing in his life. Because as you see, the next section says, You hid your face, I was dismayed. So God blessed David. God sustained David in spite of his sin. But that sin is also what caused God to hide his face. He had to, to punish David from time to time. He had to withdraw from David from time to time. And this was a cause for great grief in David. And it should be in us as well. Uh, there, there are times in which you know, our sin surely causes the Lord 
to hide his face. That doesn't mean he doesn't continue to sustain us. That doesn't mean he doesn't continue to prosper us because he loves us. But it does cause him to hide his face. And we can't confuse our prosperity with and, and the favor that God shows us with his pleasure with the way that we're living all the time. You see, the way that we grieve the Lord should grieve us as well. He says, I was dismayed. He was grieved by the way that he had grieved the Lord. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. Even in times in which things are going well, we still need God to be our helper. We still need to cry out to him and ask him to be merciful to us. Because even at our best, we are still falling short of that standard of perfection that was set before us. And so we cry out to the Lord, please remember us to be merciful upon us. And then David returns with a, another word of praise. He kind of bookends the beginning and the end of this with praise. Telling about what God has done. He says, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. All of that sorrow that he was experiencing has been turned into this overwhelming joy. You have loosed my sackcloth. Of course, the, the ritual garb of, of uh, well, of mourning, really. Uh, that's, that's the best word for it. You've turned my mourning into dancing. David already uses the right word for it. They would routinely dress in sackcloth as an outward expression of the inward discomfort they were feeling. Um, but but it is saying, you have loosed my sackcloth. You have taken that off and clothed me with gladness. You have replaced that discomfort with, uh, with gladness. And my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So as we've looked at this and we've seen this wide range of emotions in David's life, I hope there's something in here that resonates with you. I don't know where you may be. You may be in that, that pit right now, crying out to the Lord to be merciful. You may be on the tail end of that, where God has just brought you out of something. And to that, I would encourage you to give thanks, to give Him glory, to sing His praises forevermore. Because God has gone above and beyond to make a place for us to be with Him. And that place is right within you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit he is with you always, forever. We don't have to, uh, to to worry about, you know, holding to this perfect standard lest we be, you know, expelled like in the garden. We don't have to worry about carrying it around uh, like the tabernacle. We don't have to worry about defending it or, or building it up like the temple. The Spirit of the Lord is within you. God has overcome each and every one of our failings and has created a way that cannot be taken away. And for that we should rejoice. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you as we reflect on these words of David. We thank you for who you are and we thank you for what you have done. Lord, let us never uh, begin another day of our lives without recognizing what you have given us, without recognizing what you have brought us through, and Lord, without recognizing the way that you have demonstrated your love for us in the past and in all things. Lord, we uh, give you thanks for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit in each and every one of us that, that know you. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for overcoming our deficiencies. Lord, we couldn't uh, ever keep up with everything that we would need to, Lord, to maintain communion with you. And so you in your mercy and your love and your grace, Lord, you have chosen to maintain communion with us. And Lord, we should be grateful. Help us to sing your praises forevermore. And Lord, I don't know, as we mentioned earlier, I don't know where everyone here is. And so we just lift up a prayer for those that are in those moments of sorrow. Those who are going through the pit, those who are struggling right now, Lord, we lift them up to you praying that you would continue to sustain them. Lord, you, our text here reminds us that you are our sustainer, Lord. You 
Uh, you cause us to endure. You help us to endure when the world seems to be against us. You help us to stand against this world. And Lord, we thank you for that. And we pray that blessing for those that, that need that right now. Those that feel that they are being tossed to and fro. Lord, I pray that you would help them to stand. To be able to say, I will not be moved. But to recognize, Lord, that it's not because of our own doing. Help us to not grow arrogant in our prosperity as we saw in the life of David. And we, we know that we've done it in our lives. Uh, Lord, we, we are not innocent of that sin. Help us to not mistake your blessing, uh, Lord, for anything that we have done. And uh, grow to think, Lord, that we can do so without you. Uh, Lord, we need your provision. We need your protection. We rest in you. And Lord, we pray for the morning. The morning that brings joy. We thank you. Lord, we pray that as we look expectantly to that moment, because we do expect it. Lord, we know that it will come. It's a promise. The sorrow will last for the night and you sustain us through it, but the joy is coming. And so we, we thank you in advance. We look again expectantly toward it. And Lord, I ask that when the time comes, you would help us to be bold and sing your praises forevermore, giving thanks for what you have done. And Lord, we ask these things, praying in the way that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, church family, as always, I love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And I'll see you next week.